and management is an essential part of this. So focusing on really more um, biological side of the effects in the polar regions, right? We, we always talk about the global sense, but when we are considering the biological effect, it's really that the organisms will be most impacted by the regional specific changes. And so in the, in the polar regions, it's this rapid change that is happening and the multiple stressors. So it's not just the oceanification, it's not the warming. Different polar regions will be affected by different stressors, loss of ice, freshening, especially in the Arctic, maybe certification and loss of nutrients more in the Antarctic. But as Martin has said, we are not talking about the mean changes. That, that, those are projections, but those do not contain the seasonality effects, multiple stressor effects. So what biology really responds to is the duration of the exposure. It's the extreme events, the, the variability, and really how frequently the organisms will be exposed to the changes. So if we are talking about the increased frequency, then we can also can expect that those organisms will be most impacted. One thing that I find it as a very good tool when you're, we are talking about effects is the OA thresholds, right? Or thresholds in general. These are the points or the values that are characterizing significant negative responses. And usually we think of those as there is no uh, point back in the normal state, right? Once those thresholds have been crossed. And it's a really good tool how you can actually relate it to different models, to different uh, observations. and easily to um, understand the implications for the marine ecosystems. So I would like to show you how we have been applying different thresholds for different scenarios in different regions to understand this different 1.5 versus 2 um, uh, degree effect in different regions. All right. So these are um, projections for the acidification in the polar regions in the on the upper figure, Southern Ocean, and in the lower figure, the Arctic. And what's really obvious is that regardless of the scenarios, we're going to see these corrosive conditions. So this is called this aragonite saturation state that has been defined by the previous speakers before, will be, will be occurring within a decade in these polar regions, right? What we see here is that the Arctic is actually much more impacted because of the other stressors that are reducing aragonite saturation state, so more corrosive conditions compared to the Southern Ocean. And here are the scenarios in blue, no emission, in orange, low emission, and high emission. So here, even small addition to the to, to the waters will actually cause very rapid changes in terms of the reduction of the suitable habitats. So when we are talking about the corrosive waters, uh, that's associated with thresholds that are referring to the severe biological conditions. And these are in here, so at, at aragonite saturation state one. But the fact is that actually a lot of biological responses are happening at much higher level, so at more moderate conditions. And so you can have less corrosive conditions and you will still start triggering these moderate responses. And this happened somewhere around 1.5 for pelagic calcifiers in here. So that is actually the difference between 1.5 and 2. So just from that perspective, it's really important to keep this anthropogenic carbon emission below 400 ppms or 1.5 scenarios. So in terms of Arctic, that we know that are really essential fisheries ground, and here I'm covering the Beaufort Sea, Chukchi, and the Bering Sea. And you can see how quickly they are basically degrading in terms of aragonite saturation state. This is the threshold for the 550 or 2 degree scenario. But look at this. If we now are projecting this more sensitive thresholds into this happening at 450, projected for 1.5 degrees, we'll see that while Bering Sea might start seeing some of these corrosive conditions by 2040 or so, um, the Chukchi Sea will happen be before 2030, and for the Beaufort Sea, that is really vulnerable region already, it's happening now or will start happening in the future. So these are really, uh, the thresholds are those very ex existential tools really to demonstrate when the biological conditions or negative responses will start happening in terms of, of um, changes in the carbonate chemistry. 
Okay, so I gave you some of the um, background on the, on the chemistry and how we can link it to the thresholds, but just to give you some more of mechanistic understanding of biological impacts in here. When we're talking about the ocean acidification, and so that's going to be my primary stressor, but don't forget that really the stressors are not happening in, in isolation. We, this is all adding up now, right? But just in terms of ocean acidification, the, the aragonite saturation state or corrosive waters is not the only stressor. pH alone or CO2 in terms of hypercapnia can cause different responses in different species. So, for example, fish really are responding to hypercapnic conditions um, related to CO2. So then we start seeing some of the effects, first on the organismal level, changes in the phytosynthesis, lower trophic levels, calcification, and, and physiological responses. But that, very quickly, in a chronic terms, can, can become a um, population level effect. And from population level effects, you can start having some winners, some losers, and very quickly we are moving up the food, food webs, changes in the biogeography, and ultimately the ecosystem services that we are all dependent upon. And just to really um, stress again how important that is, right? So while the OA is happening in that realm, the other stressors are not only adding sometimes antagonistically, sometimes synergistically, so it's not always a linear effect adding to these uh, negative effects on biology, but what is also happening is that temperature specifically is amplifying all the other regional stressors, freshening, uh, loss of sea ice, certification, again, depending on where we are, uh, Arctic versus Antarctic. Okay, and here, um, the most charismatic species so far, OA indicators, and some governments have already implemented these species as the OA indicators because they contain the shell, uh, aragonite, aragonite shell that is quickly dissolving in the corrosive conditions. So you can very quickly um, actually monitoring what's, what's happening with these species in the natural environment. So cheropods are actually pelagic snails. They are part of the zooplankton. As said, their, their shell is made of aragonite, and that is more soluble form of calcium carbonate. That's why the shell is really rapidly dissolving, and that doesn't, ha doesn't have to take you know, months to dissolve. It can happen on a days to weeks time scales when they're um, exposed to undersaturated conditions. What's really important in the polar regions is they are one of the really the most dominant um, calcifiers in the pelagic realm, and they're really important as a food source. These are just some of the species that are feeding on it. So from uh, macrozooplankton to variety of different fish, especially in the Arctic, salmon, but also birds and whales are dependent on them. Um, so shell dissolution, as we observe it, being an indicator, is that it's a very sensitive indicator. So we, by monitoring the shell, we can actually understand what's going on um, in the pelagic communities. But obviously, we have, we have, we cannot monitor everything in the natural environment, right? So if we can have an indicator of ecosystem health, we can eventually start seeing how these responses in pteropods are happening on higher trophic levels or, um, or um, to other classifying species that we know that could have the same predisposition to dissolution, for example. So very important part in all this is that we are always talking about the predictions. But when it comes to pteropods being affected in the natural environment, those changes are actually observable already. This is the study we have conducted in 2012, pteropods from the Southern Ocean region. Normally, you would be expecting pristine shells on the left. But what we have found in the Scotia Sea um, are these really severely dissolved shells vulnerable to predation, to, to infections, and so on. And important point, what we uh, explicitly um, have demonstrated in this study is that if it wasn't really for this anthropogenic carbon in the system of the Southern Ocean, we would not be seeing this level of the dissolution that we have seen. So it's crucial to keep that component in there. 
So that was the Southern Ocean. But what we have seen in the Beaufort Sea, remember I was telling you about how vulnerable that system was, is much higher level of severity of, of the corrosion. I mean, I, haven't be, I have been looking at these theropods from all around the globe, but this, what is happening in the Arctic right now, are one of the most significant severe changes that, that, that I have ever seen in my life. So just look at this, the level of severity of the corrosion after a couple of weeks of exposure in the Beaufort Sea. But why, why is that important, right? If I can monitor the, monitor the shell dissolution, I can really start delineating when the most severe biological conditions are happening, where are the hotspots for oceanification, right? So I can very nicely link it to the carbonate chemistry. So dissolution is going to be happening, but it really depends on the emission scenarios. So in ideal world, we would have terabots with um, pristine shells, but as we are going down towards 400 or 450, we start seeing first effects. So the shell starts um, becoming a bit dissolved and we see it on a surface, but th those sort of changes are moderate. The species can recuperate, they can repair their shells, so it's not going to be massively uh, impacting there. But as we are going into the two point degree two degree scenarios, 550, we already start seeing that the shell is actually much more impacted, much more severe uh, level of dissolution. And this is where the, sh the organisms cannot or have to actually expend a lot of energy before they can um, recuperate back. And that can have implications for the growth, for the other processes that are vital for the organisms. Okay. It's not all about the shell dissolution, obviously not, but it helps us delineate how quickly the habitats will be changing. And here, um, the Arctic on the top and Antarctic at the bottom, under the same scenario, RCP 8.5, uh, in different years, so even in 20 years' time, that is approximately 1 to 1.5 degree change. We can see that in the Arctic, Quite a lot of areas are uh, being uh, delineated as lost habitat for these pelagic calcifiers in the Southern Ocean a bit less, especially in the Ross Sea and the Weddell Sea that are more sensitive uh, areas. But projected in the next 40 years, you can see that a large extent of the Arctic as indicated by red is actually lost in terms for this species and many other calcifiers with similar sensitivities and the Antarctic is following but is not there yet. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Nina. Very sobering uh, news. But <coughs> Yeah, to put some uh, a positive side on the development in ocean acidification research. No pressure, no pressure. <laughs> no, how the international how the international community is now coming together, how uh, working towards developing some very robust SDG products. Bronte Tilbrook from. The ACE and uh, Cesaro Institutes from Hobart in Tasmania. Thank you, Bronte. Thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, the, I want to thank the three previous speakers for their great introduction. And um, just go through, hang on, I've got to find my way here. Um, okay, getting there. So this is more of a, oh, that one, okay. So um, the three free previous speakers gave a really great introduction about why Goon exists in, uh, in these regions. And Goon uh, started in 2013. It stands for the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. And it's about um, bringing together a community to detect ocean acidification on local and global scales. Uh, we're starting to work on uh, monitoring biological response and documenting that. And uh, with the ultimate aim of Go On is to uh, deliver better predictions of what's changing and the impact it will have on ecosystems. And there are a number of other aspects of the work, including developing better data products for decision makers, um, capacity building, 
and outreach and, and uh, Peter Straczynski will go into uh, some of the capacity building efforts that Goan's involved as a part of in the future. So um, one of the key parts of Goan is to build uh, collaborative hubs. And this is, a, in, this is a diagram of the hubs that exist at present. <coughs> Most, there's one in the Arctic that's just forming. Now that the uh, SCAR reports are being finalised, we're, uh, we're going to start working on a Southern Ocean hub. And uh, it's, it's long, well, the hub is long overdue, but uh, in, in being uh, set up. But it's part of a reflection of the difficulty. There's not that many nations involved. It's hard to get down there. There's not a heck of a lot of data at present. And it's probably a reason why we need to really get on it. So the hubs themselves, these are some of their, um, uh, some of the things they do. It's, uh, first of all, they pull regional knowledge and expertise and they enhance, the, the aim, one of the aims of the hubs is to enhance collaboration between the, the people involved and uh, to identify gaps and where capability needs to be developed. And another key aspect of the work is to uh, gather the data and, and build products that people or decision makers can use and communities. Um, there's also uh, aspects of the work involved in uh, uh, outreach and education. And also another important aspect of the work uh, is on input to the Sustainable Development Goal process. So uh, in 2015, the UN established its Sustainable Development Goals, including number 14 for the ocean. And one of the 10 targets for that was uh, that Sustainable Development Goal 14 was SDG 14.3, which is on ocean acidification. And I think it was recognition of the concerns about the impact of acidification on uh, marine ecosystems. Uh, the UN also established a uh, indicator, and Goan has been uh, very active in helping to identify uh, or develop the method of, for reporting, uh, how to quality control the data, and uh, there will be a call going out soon to national data centres to start delivering the pH data into uh, the uh, International Ocean Data Exchange, which is run by the United Nations. So we hope to build from that a much better picture of, based on measurements of pH change through the oceans and also to identify gaps. Um, in, and uh, the UN also established uh, voluntary commitments for the Sustainable Development Goals and uh, Goan and its regional hubs and many members have uh, committed uh, and made voluntary commitments. And, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, a voluntary commitment can be made by government, uh, individuals or organisations and it is, it's an aim to just let everyone know what is being done and the time frames over which it will be done. Um, and in parallel with that, the UN also established Communities of Ocean Action. If you may have heard of this, this is uh, a, a group that's assessing the voluntary commitments to see how they all fit together and where they may be developed further. Uh, the, now, the voluntary commitments, there's a big meeting happening in June 2020 in Portugal, and it's aimed at um, working out where we are at present with ocean acidification and all other uh, ocean uh, commitments, and uh, looking at to, to take those commitments and, and develop more in going into the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which starts in 2021. Um, we, I'm, so enough on go on and um, voluntary commitments and SDGs. Uh, I think that um, I want to just talk a little bit about the Southern Ocean because most of the meeting uh, here has been about um, the Arctic uh, it, and other, other, not just this meeting but others and for, for very good reasons but the Southern Ocean is sort of the poor cousin at the moment and it's one of those critical areas uh, for influencing global climate and ocean acidification responses, as, as Nina pointed out. Um, there are a number of stresses, some of them listed here. Uh, CO2 and pH are really wrap, wrapped up as ocean acidification. And they, uh, the stresses might be different for different communities or habitats. So pelagic and benthic organisms uh, have a suite of stresses and phytoplankton have some additional ones, including uh, 
availability of trace nutrients. Um, we don't know, as Nina pointed out, the sensitivity to these different stresses and how they interact, and that's a uh, that's going to require a lot of effort, I think, and, and data collection to really understand uh, how the systems are responding. Um, and as uh, I think all the authors, uh, all the previous speakers pointed out, there are thresholds. Uh, they're not they're chemical thresholds, thresholds, not necessarily biological uh, thresholds. So. Um, we can determine uh, those and I just wanted to give you an example here of these are some measurements from the Southern Ocean of the aragonite saturation state. So the top panel shows uh, the saturation state uh, and the right is Australia, left is um, the, southern, uh, the Antarctic shelf. And the red line is the saturation horizon of one. That, uh, so water's deeper than that, below that red are undersaturated. And you can see it's rising up to the surface around 60 to 50 south. That's a physical, that's a circulation feature. Um, and values of about 1.5 occur in the, uh, this is in the summertime in the, the, um, those latitudes, 60, 60 to 50. The bottom panel shows the variations in the last 23 years, between 2018 and 1995. It's a little bit complex because of the movements in the front positions of fronts and eddies moving through the area. But uh, I, I just wanted to point out that the saturation states have been declining. The values are around 0.15 uh, and at its surface, uh, but, but variable again. And so we're well on our way to this undersaturation state at this present emission scenario. Um, now, back to really what we know. This is a diagram of this from, uh, from Go On of the Southern Ocean data collection and it shows a lot of gaps. The green lines I hope you can see are the lines that are used to measure the saturation states in the, in the water column and they occur every seven to ten years, once every seven to ten years. They're very um, detailed measurements. The blue lines are the uh, uh, surface underway observations, and they, as uh, Nina and, and Helen have pointed out, mostly in summer, uh, so the data are somewhat biased towards summer months. And there's a bunch of other icons on there. The only surface mooring I'm aware of is this one here that's reporting data uh, through the year. And so it's a really sparse observation set, and uh, that makes validation of models difficult. It makes um, understanding what's changing and the extremes that are really important for, for the um, uh, understanding biological response are very difficult to characterise. But there are new technologies coming on board. Helen uh, mentioned Argo floats. This is an example from Biogeochemical Argo. The green dots are uh, floats that are active. The red dots are floats that are either inactive or under ice and not reporting because they need to come to the surface to transmit data. Uh, that's allowing us to get winter data for the f some of the first winter data we've ever collected and it's been uh, a v really valuable. But it's not the only kind of technology. There are new autonomous surface vehicles now. Um, this is a sail drone. Sail drone completed its first circumantarctic navigation and it's the first one by an autonomous vehicle and it happened in June 2019. It's a five month voyage. Collected really high quality pH, CO2 data and others. Uh, acoustic data for ecosystem assessments, uh, bio-optics. They're really uh, very useful instruments that we hope to see rolled out in the future. They can stay out uh, in the winter. Uh, they have, uh, you can modify the mission. They're not like a float that comes up where it, wherever it's located. Uh, and they can be used in coasted offshore period, uh, regions, but of course not in sea ice. They don't do too well traveling through sea ice. But they're still very useful for the open ocean. And I just wanted to finish with the other region that's really critical that we have very few measurements is in the coastal, uh, the, in the shelf and uh, Antarctic shelf and coastal regions. And that's under a lot of, there's a lot of variability uh, there that's occurring through many processes. Uh, the, the thinning and retreat of ice shelves, the uh, uh, increased uh, changing in wind patterns that's uh, leading to some upwelling of relatively CO2 rich and oxygen depleted waters, um, changes in uh, stratification, maybe increased fishing pressure in the future. 
And all that leads to a lot of variability and there is virtually no monitoring in most of Antarctica on the shelf. And I'll just give you one example here. Uh, the US has its long-term ecological research site at Palmer Base in the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and I think the UK do work at Rothera, uh, seasonal sampling. Apart from that, it's just opportunistic. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, ecosystem uh, that we don't really know about. Just one example. Off, this is the, um, off the Mertz Polinia. Um, and a, at about 600 to 850 metres, so just above the aragonite saturation site, we found very um, dense aragonitic coral sponge beds. And they existed in the Mertz Polinia by um, which, if you look in the top figure, I don't have a pointer, but just to the, up here, that's the Mertz Glacier Tongue. And in 2010, that's how it looked. There was a big uh, iceberg grounded behind it. This, is, this glacier tongue is about 80 kilometres long. It's the site of significant bottom water formation in the Southern Ocean. About a quarter of the uh, bottom water formation occurred in that polynia. In 2011, that um, B9B, the, the big grounded iceberg, broke loose and snapped off the Mertz glacier tongue. It's just an example of how, rapid thing, how rapidly things can change in the Southern Ocean. When it snapped off, it released all the pack ice from the back, and that flooded into the Mertz Glacier region and it increased production. It actually drove saturation states up. It drove production up and it still maintains high production in that area. It also de decreased um, uh, bottom water formation. And uh, that's significant because the, the aragonitic corals uh, appeared to exist because it wasn't just that there was production in the polynia that was bringing food to them, but also the, the flow of water, uh, the outflow of the polynia uh, is, was also a, a contributing factor, and that has slowed. So it's not even clear now if those uh, things exist, if the beds exist. So there's a lot of complications. That's just one example. We need to really up our effort in collecting both offshore and shelf environments. There's a lot of technology now, including on the shelf, where we can deploy sensors year long. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. See, that was good news. And all this requires some very thorough international coordination. So I'm very happy to welcome Peter Swarzenski from IEA, uh, who's going to talk about uh, the International Coordination Center and capacity building, as uh, Bronte alluded to, and collaborative uh, actions to address ocean acidification. So thank you, Peter. You want me to? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Peter Sporzenski. I work for the IEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency in, in Monaco. And what I'm going to do um, in my 10 minutes, seven minutes or 10 minutes, is talk a little bit about international coordination and capacity building. But I wanted to, before I get into that, to underscore what my previous um, my colleagues have presented. So I have just a couple of slides as a snapshot of, of some of the results from the AMAP report as well as the IPCC report. All right, so the IEA in Monaco, since the early 60s, the IEA has had a very strong um, collaboration and partnership with Monaco um, around many aspects of ocean um, research. <clears throat> We're the only marine lab in the UN system, and this allows us some particular advantages to work our, with our sister UN agencies, such as, for example, FAO. <clears throat> um, as a testament to that, we have work going on with FAO right now on the Nansen project, um, which is a, a Norway FAO collaboration um, <clears throat> with a Friedrich Nansen research vessel going around Africa to look at um, many different um, environmental stressors, including ocean acidification. 
In Monaco, I run a, a radio ecology lab where we develop and utilize a whole suite of radio tracers to study environmental stressors, um, such as OA, such as ocean acidification, ocean warming, deoxygenation, um, contaminant transfer into coastal marine ecosystems and their biota, as well as marine plastics and harmful algal blooms. And as was mentioned by um, Nina, this is certainly not happening in isolation, but um, is happening uh, as multi-stressors. And so at the, at the labs in Monaco, we have this ability to recreate any kind of ecosystem, be it Arctic or tropical, and can look at the effects of multi-stressors. <coughs> so Monaco, um, as many of you know, just, just um, a month and a half ago, released the, the SROC report in Monaco, and um, <clears throat> I, I will leave it at that. We've certainly had many dis discussions on this. But interestingly, I wanted to I, I put that in as a lead into this next slide, and this is data from NASA that shows uh, the polar extent in the, in the Arctic Ocean. So in yellow is a four-decade average minimum, and um, I'm also showing the September 2019 low um, ice extent. And so this, this was reported, I think it was September 19th, so just a week before the SROC report came out in, in Monaco. And it, I think this was uh, the second smallest ice um, extent in the Arctic. So as we well know, the, the effects of climate change are particularly pronounced in the subarctic and Arctic oceans, with Arctic temperatures rising at more than two times the global average. So as we've heard from, from our previous speakers, I just have a quick summary on this. What is unique about the Arctic? Well, we know warming is, is, is accelerated. Some of the fastest rates of ocean acidification and we know that just simply because cold water absorbs CO2 much better. This is something that Helen mentioned. We have um, some of the very large <coughs> Arctic rivers discharging both sediment and fresh water into the Arctic. And the work of Milliman and Stavitsky and many others have shown that with a changing climate, um, the sediment load coming into the Arctic and the, and, and the carbon load has changed dramatically. And this is obviously is going to have impacts to, to people interested in looking at change in the carbon cycle. <clears throat> we have very broad, shallow shelves in the Arctic, and this has implications to, as, as Bronte was just mentioning, with the saturation state moving up and down in the waters in response to circulation patterns. So, so different water masses, warmer um, water masses moving into one side of the Arctic and then descending um, through the other outlet. We have extreme erosion rates in the Arctic um, in many places, for example, in Alaska, erosion rates can, are typically five meters a year can, and go as high as 10 meters a year. I have a, one photo here um, showing from some of the work that we've been doing on North Slope, Alaska, where we're trying to look at the, the carbon and nitrogen flux related to these really um, extreme erosion events. <clears throat> and then this last point, again, linked to global circulation. So as these waters mix into the Arctic, they're, they're bringing different pH waters, different salinity, different temperature waters, and all of these have an implication to the pH change in the Arctic. One quick snapshot of some work in north of Iceland in the Iceland Sea. You can see a very systematic decline in pH over the last, um, what is it, since 1985 to present. Um, very systematic decline in pH. And then in terms of projections, as has been mentioned by my, my um, the, the panel, impacts are more severe than previously thought. Arctic marine waters will undergo widespread, rapid, and non-uniform acidification. OA has already um, a direct and indirect effect in Arctic marine wildlife, as Nina has showed. Arctic East Arctic ecosystems are then going to undergo major change as a result of OA, plus these other stressors. And <clears throat> as Martin has mentioned, then um, we are increasing risks of reaching limits to their ability to adapt to these um, multitude of stressors. Have one overview slide of, of the SROC report from the Arctic, just to underscore ocean pH. <clears throat> very confident across each one of the water bodies. And then for the Arctic, um, we have a medium level of confidence 
in many of the, uh, the, the various stressors. Okay, so with that kind of um, quick overview, the next series of slides deal with the work of the OAICC, the, the um, Ocean Acidification International Coordination Center that is being run out of Monaco. Um, I have on the left um, a plot showing the number of papers over recent time, and you can see this tremendous surge in papers, just say like the last 15 years or so ago. Um, and the IEA member states, in response to the surge in interest, um, asked us to, to um, develop or put together a Ocean Acidification International Co coordinated Coordination Center. So another way to look at how quickly OA is growing, um, it's amazing that really the, the science of OA, OA is still relatively young, maybe just um, 15 years or so. This is a global map showing the number of papers first by first author affiliation on a global um, perspective. You can see certainly where there are hotspots of investments in OA research that have paid off in these papers, but it also shows where maybe there are some um, renewed investments in, in particular um, environments, and this is where the OAICC will come in. So the, the three activities of the OAICC are communication, science, and capacity building, and our target audience is everything from scientists to policymakers to educators and students, and with our many collaborators, and I'll show that in just a second, we've developed kind of a, a, a suite of different tools that allows us to, to work in OA and to communicate on OA, um, such as expert missions and, um, for trainings, mentoring, online resources like the bibliographic database. Um, we are engaged in best practices. Um, from, a, from an IEA implementation point of view, the, the OAICC is something called the Peaceful Uses Initiative Project, and through that vehicle, we are um, been very lucky to be able to bring money in from um, already 12 member states. <coughs> So here's just an overview slide of our many partners. Um, they're everything from multinational governments to universities and everything in between. And certainly the work of the OICC strongly hinges on this productive, um, very fruitful collaboration across the board. Bronte did a nice job talking about Go On, the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network. I'm just going to underscore. Uh, the three things related to the go on, and that is that we want to document status and trends of OA in both coastal and open ocean systems. We want to better understand the impacts of OA on diverse marine ecosystems and their biota, and then we want to be able to, to um, forecast OA impacts into future scenarios. So now looking at a, a global map of, of the reach of the OAICC, this is OAICC sponsored trainings and networking opportunities. You can see there's been um, a, a lot of activity in, in South America, in the Caribbean, in, in many of our African member states as well as in Southeast Asia. Um, specifically, for the same duration of time, there's been almost 700 capacity building opportunities involving 500 scientists from almost 70 countries. So I think the OAICC has, has with its many partners has been really effective in, in, in all things related to ocean acidification. <clears throat> so I mentioned the Peaceful Uses Initiative. The, OA, the, the IEA also has something called a Coordinated Research Program and Radiocology Labs just kicked off a new CRP on the global impacts of OA on seafood. And the idea is we're working with 17 member states to systematically look at how seafood might be impacted by the, by the um, common effects of, of, or the systematic effects of ocean acidification. Bronte touched on this, so I'll, I'll mention this just very quickly, but um, as a UN entity, the IEA and, and the OACC is specifically involved in two aspects of the SGD process as it relates to 14 Point three on OA, we are involved in the reporting process to help um, IOC, UNESCO, and, and Go On members to develop new methodologies and data management tools and techniques to better report. We're also involved in what Bronte touched on quickly, this community of ocean action on OA. 
And with that, I will conclude. And I just wanted to show, showcase the first OA training in South Africa in 2015. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. We have time for some questions, some follow-up. Yep. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation. My name is Gideon Bechar from Israel. It was mentioned a few times here that the, <coughs> uh, 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 that the polar areas are uh, uh, warming uh, much faster than the rest of the world, and I would like to have an explanation why is that, especially in the Northern Pole. Thank you. I, I answered too many questions earlier this afternoon, so it's one, it's one of your turns. Yeah, yeah, I see. This is a good question for you, Martin, yeah. Oh, yes, uh, sorry, I was in that um, The Arctic is warm. Oh, I can go that way. Yes. So um, the question was, as I understand, why the Arctic is warming so much faster. Why? 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 Yes, absolutely. So um, there are several reasons, uh, and most of them are um, are a the connecting t um, the connection of the Arctic climate system to the global system. So you actually have a very well connected system on both the ocean side and also on the atmospheric side. Something that contrasts to the uh, to the southern polar region. Um, you have a very open Atlantic region that brings um, brings warm water to the Arctic, so um, and you have um, a, a storm track that actually can lead if there is not a strong polar high uh, high pressure system, which is actually created by the cold in the first place. You get a lot of penetration of of uh, warmer air into higher into the Arctic, which is exactly what we are seeing increasing over the last decades on both fronts, both the warm water and the warm air. But then very, very importantly, the reason why it actually warms where there is so much more warming in the Arctic as surface temperatures at about twice the global, uh, twice the global warming um, in the Arctic compared to the rest of the globe is that there are these albedo feedbacks from the diminishing ice and snow in the region. So both snow and also the sea ice extent in in the summer have extend have uh, diminished by about the same rate, 13 percent per decade in terms of uh, extent, and that feeds back into to the climate system, uh, both air and also the sea, because more of the um, more of the darker landscape is open to get warmed by the by the ir irradiation of the sun so there is a feedback effect uh, that that uh, ex that basically ex expands the warming in the arctic that comes from both land and also the uh, also on sea so these things are feeding into each other and warming the arctic uh, at twice about twice the global rate important to know is also that that rate is going to stay at about twice the rate for the remainder of this century. So what that actually means is that we are at the moment in the Arctic already living in a two degree world in the Arctic itself. And we will do that same factor two for the rest of the century in terms of how we relate in the Arctic region to global warming. Uh, Carol. We, we, we've heard quite a bit about the impacts and then about the observations and how there's this bottom-up approach by scientists to coordinate across the world. Um, obviously, they need money to do that, don't they? Is there a sufficient going in? And what can the international community do to assist with that? We just heard that the Nordic Arctic Council of Ministers, uh, the, the, the Declaration on the Ocean and Climate, have, have said they're putting more money into ocean acidification. Um, but where, where are the gaps uh, and, and um, how can we really make this work? Thanks, Carol. It's a great question. Um, with a, I don't know. I think it's a complex answer. The 
Uh, I think in the Arctic there's uh, a lot more uh, interest from nations because of there are people living on the edge of the Arctic, uh, their, their influence, it's right in the backyard of Europe. In the Southern Ocean it really relies on national programs um, and most of the countries that uh, in that region are uh, not exactly flush with money to uh, support research. So, uh, for example, one of the biggest providers of data for the Southern Ocean is the US and will probably continue to do so, be so in the future. Um, other countries like China are starting to become much more active and hopefully will be investing in um, research. At the moment, um, if you look at how much surface, say, surface ocean carbon data, two thirds of it comes from Australia and the US and the rest comes from other countries. So there's, there's uh, plenty of opportunity for groups to work together. Um, I, I don't know what the model is to get investment into this region. Um, for, well, for example, I showed you some of the autonomous sensors. There's, there's a, a good opportunity for even private investors to support research using those autonomous vessels to get uh, data. And that's happening to some degree. The Circum Antarctic navigation by the saildrome is supported by a um, Chinese um, philanthropist. So, uh, or, or um, actually I'm not real sure, I think it's a uh, philanthropic organisation from uh, Hong Kong. So, um, you know, there are signs that those things are starting to happen, uh, but I, I believe it's going to be driven by governments pushing a need for uh, this work. And look, the Arctic and the Southern Ocean are probably two of the most critical regions uh, in the climate system for, uh, for the ocean. So uh, really needs, uh, governments need to stand up, or well, I hope they will. Thanks. I'd just like to add that hopefully and potentially the requests soon from Go On to get a national overview of, uh, of, of data knowledge would actually highlight to certain nations that might be, I don't say ignorance is the wrong word, but complacent or uh, have a, a different opinion of their work, their investment compared to what is actually useful data might be a good uh, catalyst for promoting greater national efforts. The challenge in, in the challenge in the Southern Ocean and in the Central Arctic is nobody owns it, so nobody has an obligation. So. But again, going back to the beginning, the stakeholder involvement to get the fisheries people involved, to get the uh, communities involved, will actually facilitate better access and more targeted uh, measurements there, I hope. Um, any more questions? We have five minutes left. left. Sure. It's for you. A little bit to know why... Why you shows that the Ross Sea and the Weddell Sea were more impacted in terms of the uh, acidification? There's some reason, physical reason, chemical reason, what? I think it has to do with the general circulation. There's uh, the Weddell Gyre and the Ross Sea uh, Gyre that. Um, it, it tends to amplify these effects, from what I understand. Um, much broader shells, um, and along, say, East Antarctica, there's very narrow shells, so it's very much driven by offshore processes with some upwelling. Yeah, so I think it's a general circulation feature. Mm. Yes, I think it's, it's coming back. Sorry. Uh, what uh, we see that there is an increase, uh, increasing uh, traffic of ships in the in the Arctic. Uh, uh, what, in your opinion, are the effects of this uh, shipping increase? How will it affect uh, global warming, climate change in the northern pole? Now I'm awake too. <laughs> um, there are 
there is a concomitant increase, I would say, of shipping in the Arctic with the receding sea ice. It's not the only driver of, uh, of the increasing shipping in the Arctic. There are global economic uh, reasons for that as well. So, um, but we do see increased shipping in the Arctic and the projections are also for that to increase from the economic side. Um, so first of all, uh, there are economic and, and um, uh, impacts on people and on, on, on potentially on biodiversity because the Arctic shipping governance is often not region specifically equipped to deal with this uh, increased shipping traffic. So this is a, uh, not, not a direct uh, impact of climate change, but a concomitant uh, and, Im and immediate um, a link to, to climate change that we have more risks and, uh, or to biodiversity and people uh, in the Arctic that come through the increased shipping. We also uh, understand from the literature that uh, some of the shipping routes that um, or some of the shipping traffic that goes through the Arctic and is in forecast to go through the Arctic increasingly is actually taking away from the shipping traffic through, for example, the Suez Canal. So it has some economic effects for those who are invested into these more southern routes as well. Uh, and then there's a whole, um, there's a whole uh, field of research uh, on how, for example, the, ex the, the emissions from shipping traffic can affect uh, climate regionally through, for example, uh, carbon particles and, and other um, sulfur-based and, and nitrogen-based emissions. And these, uh, actually, AMAP has done quite a bit of work on that, so there are reports out there. Um, the, um, in a nutshell, I would say that uh, the impact of these emissions on climate change directly depend very, very much on the speed uh, of uh, the engines, how they run uh, on the fuel that is used. And so it's not a straightforward answer, but we do know that the carbon emissions that come out of ship, um, our ship emissions, the, the political carbon can actually contribute to local melting of, of ice and snow. But in effect, how it's, it's a very complicated picture uh, because some of the exhaust uh, gases are actually cooling and some of them warming so the balance between the with the various gases actually is not easy to forecast but it depends on how fast these these ships run and how fast their engines run just one follow-up to that um, there are new regulations, shipping regulations now, which require the exhaust to, to actually be cleaned of, of sulfur dioxide and, nitrous ox and nitrogen dioxide. That water now that used to go up into the atmosphere for the bigger ships is now going to be pumped directly as sulfuric acid and nitric acid into the sea, sea lanes, which may not be too great if the ships were randomly crossing the Arctic, but they are going to be following icebreakers and they're going to be there during the weakening of the marginal ice zone. So you're going to get a line of acidified water. And David Turner and others from Gothenburg University have modeled the effect on, on these shipping lines and in these harbors. And the potential effect on a seasonal scale of pH reduction is going to be the same as a century of anthropogenic CO2 on a, on a short scale. So. So sorry to come again, maybe I should have actually made that more clear, um, especially, well, there are many people in the Arctic, many communities that rely on um, sea ice hunting, on going out on the sea ice for travel routes uh, to actually make a livelihood. And uh, especially in those regions where you have channels uh, separating islands, um, we will, we are, there is a lot of concern and impacts of even one ship that goes through these uh, waters in the wrong time of the season because then, for example, whole caribou herds cannot reach their summer grounds. People cannot reach their hunting, uh, um, uh, um, their hunting uh, areas. People cannot do uh, what they need to do in order to get from, get from A to B. So while this sounds uh, strange from a perspective of people further south. This is actually the lifeblood of many of the Arctic communities. And I just quote uh, from a workshop that we had earlier uh, where, where local people said just, you know, one ship can do a lot of damage uh, to, to basically livelihoods for a whole year. 
In the Arctic, not in the Antarctic, ships still run on heavy fuel oil for the most parts. Uh, and spills, potential spills, this is a dangerous ground for shipping. Uh, lots of things can go wrong, storms can come, uh, rescue um, services are far away. Uh, whenever something happens, there's a real big uh, chance for spills. And we know that uh, heavy fuel oil is actually devastating to marine life. So while these not, are not maybe not direct changes of climate change, uh, impacts of climate change, they do indirectly contribute to them. Okay, we've come to the end of the session. I'd like to thank the speakers one more time and thank you for your constructive input. We'll have our next session on marine protected areas in the Southern Ocean. Thank you. <laughs>